elections are coming up. Why should people vote D66? Well, for students, I think there are many, many different reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, that party has always had very strongly uh, education, including had a higher education at the forefront of the program. Uh, strongly believing that education and a lot of effort and also putting uh, extra finances into education is a must and a key also for upcoming generation. Another one is that the party is very strong on issues which also I know keep uh, students very much alive uh, and awake also and, and energized, and that is the focus on uh, climate and climate change in the energy transition. Uh, and of course, from my own perspective, I think looking at the future of health and healthcare, and luckily many of you are at an age where healthcare and the demand on healthcare is relatively low, but also for those who have an interest in this area, I think that uh, Days as Ancestor has shown that we really need to change the course of healthcare in the Netherlands to make it uh, right. future-proof and improve the quality. So to talk a little bit more about your personal perspective there, as you said, you do have this healthcare background, you were the yep. CEO of a major hospital. So does this give you a different perspective than, say, a career politician? Um, now that you've entered politics? Oh, uh, I, th I definitely think it does. Right. Uh, so having the background yeah. and uh, having worked in healthcare in different roles for, for actually decades, I'm already that old. <laughs> uh, so if you look at the time that I actually walked around in healthcare, it was 38 years. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that really helps a lot to understand the issues, right. the, the challenges that we face, and those also find the better solutions. And obviously you do, that, you do not do that on your own as a minister, you do that with a very large staff, you do that with many people who work in the healthcare field, but doing this together, but having the knowledge yourself, yeah. really, really helps. So how can the Netherlands in particular make sure that they have more of these expert professionals enter politics? Oh, uh, for one, I'm looking at, at, at students, and for those of you who, who have a background or study in healthcare, uh, have an open mind and be also active when you're asked and, and, and seek for opportunities to do more than just being one-on-one -on -one in patient care, which is terrific. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, it, if they hadn't asked me to do something else, I would still be happily enjoying and walking around in my uh, white uniform and being active as a physician. Uh, but also, at the same time, being able to give input and change the mm -hmm. way we provide healthcare is also very, very good and should come from healthcare professionals themselves. Right, so just over two years ago, you were able to become minister and you took over from Hugo de Jonge, yeah. who at the time was heavily criticized for his handling of the pandemic um, and also heavily complimented, I suppose. But what was the actual situation in the ministry when you walked in the door? Oh, um, and, and actually it, it was January last year, yeah? right? okay. so it was just over a year ago. Um, for um, ministries of health, actually also for governments, not just in the Netherlands, not just in Europe, but also in Australia and North America and everywhere, the rise of the COVID pandemic uh, was a disaster. It was, came very, very sudden. We had taken into account that there, would, uh, that there was the possibility that we would see a new pandemic s at some point. Mm. Virologists, people working in infectious diseases had uh, warned and had taken into account. We had set up WHO uh, monitoring systems, warning systems, etc. We did do our regular uh, exercise and practices to see whether we were prepared. There were even international scores on how individual countries were or were not prepared to a potential pandemic. And yet when the pandemic came, yeah. it, and we've all noticed this, it was a, really something to take into account. And for our ministry, mm -hmm. for the Ministry of Health in the Netherlands, it actually meant taking a role which was much more also being active yourself, for instance, in the purchase of uh, personal protective materials, yeah. et cetera. Yeah a role which the ministry had never had. So when I came, in answer mm -hmm. to your question, when I came to the, to the ministry, they had been in this situation for a small two years, yeah. and they were extremely fatigued. It was still in a sort of crisis situation, and uh, one of the first things that I had to do is to bring this and normalize the situation again, and, yeah. so and say this is the new normal, 
Let's relax. So, uh, about normalizing, um, we spoke to several journalists who have been following um, the ministry closely yeah. uh, and have been looking well prepared. At, at, yeah. at what you've yeah. done. And um, they told us there's something interesting happening, happening at your ministry. And um, it was even one of the first decisions you took. And uh, it concerns a certain haystack approach. Um, okay. And that comes to, um, uh, there's a law in the Netherlands that journalists can request information from a minister or a ministry su such as yours for information, for example, about where did you buy those goods you just mentioned. Um, and they say there's something interesting happening at VWS. Uh, they are uh, uh, having a new approach called the Haystack approach, and they push out huge volumes of information uh, uh, every three or six months. Uh, and they say, we took them to court, we've won uh, all the lawsuits, yeah. but one of the first uh, decisions Mr. Kuipers took was not going back to the old ways, which is calling up the journalist saying, can you make the request a bit smaller so we can give it to you earlier? But you said, let's, com let's uh, continue the haystack approach. Why? Well, um I think we all, we all agree that it is extremely important that governments uh, and, and public offices are very, very transparent in their decision. Mm -hmm. We have in the Netherlands, like in other places, you have laws for that so that any individual citizen basically can ask for a lot of information. This, these are laws for very good reasons. Uh, at the same time, in particular, for instance, during a situation like COVID, yeah. there are many instances, not just journalists, uh, private citizens, and people who ask for information, but sometimes this information, when it relates, for instance, to the situation of COVID, can deal and focus on thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of documents. Yeah. So if we look, just look at the uh, Ministry of Health and at COVID, mm -hmm. we had at some point more than 8 million individual documents, not pages, no, documents. Yeah, on several. That fall, uh, that fall under this category. So if an individual journalist, as you refer to, comes with a question, please give me all the information in a time period from, say, January 2020 till March 2022 mm -hmm. on COVID, yeah. you literally have to give them huge amounts of documents and you can select for every individual because there is not just one not two not ten there is hundreds of people asking with different subset of criteria yeah. for this information right. so while in, instead of giving every individual exactly the, the information that you ask and then yeah. something yeah. that you ask slightly different time period slightly different search term but basically the same no. This is unworkable, so what we did is actually give them the it, large bulk of information. And this is what you argued before the court, no. and then a judge said, you still have to give it to them. Sure. W why are you not complying? Well, we do comply, we do comply, but the only workable approach is then to do this in the broader search term, instead of giving it individually selected for your situation. It would be non-compliant in a different matter, because that would requires so much work that you would, in terms of being able to provide, you would long be overdue for every individual in the, in the moment but in which you give the information. Before COVID, you were able to take the approach that most other ministries take, which is not the haystack approach. We now live in a post-COVID world. Why can you not take the alternative approach? Why do you still take the haystack approach? Because of the amount of uh, documents, the amount of available information, and yep. the number of requests, and also the, the broad focus of the requests. So if it's, it's interesting that, that you mentioned the amount of work, because Abigail Norville, one of your uh, highest civil servants, gave an interview and said, I can deliver the documents, sure. it's, it's too much work. Uh, your lawyers alleged in uh, their suit in the, in, in, the, in the court, they said when we hire 20 new lawyers on Tuesday, 10 of them walk out of the door by Wednesday. Eh? So the verloop, as we say in, in Dutch, mm. is very high at your ministry. Is, the, is it mm. maybe also that you, like in general, are not able to, um, to process these requests uh, in the way you w would even want to? No, uh, let's, I mean, uh, let's look at the audience. Just think that you would have 
uh, I see a, a gentleman here on the first row with a laptop. Suppose, I mean, you would need additional storage on your laptop, but you would have on your laptop 10 million documents, 10 million documents on just one topic. And then everybody here, and the audience here is not that large, or well, it's large, but everybody here would ask you to provide a certain selection of documents from the 10 million and do that within the requested time period of weeks. You would start on your own. You would hire a lawyer, as you mentioned. Mm. We started to hire lawyers, and at yeah. some point we had uh, 50 lawyers, and then 70, and then 100, and then 120 lawyers. But the amount of requests actually increased more and more rapid, and for each request we have to comply within a very limited time period because that's the Dutch law. Yeah. Well, these two do not match with each other. So yeah. giving everybody the exact selection that you ask for within the limited time period from a very broad perspective, this, is not, uh, this does not match with each other. So then you have to take another approach. Do you have enough staff at this moment to take on the requests? Uh, for every time, within the time period? No, we don't. Okay. And that's why we take another approach. Because right. um, you, you could say that maybe this is a broader problem at your ministry. We, for example, spoke to the mm -hmm. Rekenkamer. They had a very um, critical report uh, last year, about 5 billion, do uh, five billion euros the ministry couldn't account for, for, for example, on things they bought during COVID. And uh, we spoke to them, and the Rekenkamer said, well, we are a bit concerned. Can they find the people... To, um, with the, uh, with, with the uh, studies that is needed to see where this money went. Uh, they, do they have enough staff for that? That's an, an um, you know, they, they are worried about that. Are you also worried about uh, the staffing at your ministry, for example, for this problem? Well, if I take the question, and if you allow me to take the question a bit on a broader perspective. Yeah. Uh, because this is, I understand the questions very well and I'm happy to ask, but it may also be very detailed questions for uh, the audience. If you look on a broader perspective, whether it's my ministry hmm. or whether it is any particular organization within healthcare, not just in the Netherlands, but much broader, yep. then we see that the demand for workforce yeah. is thus that uh, we get a larger and larger gap between the amount of people that we would need and the amount of available, also young people, who are available to do the job. Yeah. If we look in healthcare in the Netherlands uh, in broader perspective, we've seen over the past 15 years, basically, we've seen a very, very rapid increase in the number of people working in healthcare, which is wonderful. And at the moment in the Netherlands, one out of every six people with a job, one in six mm -hmm. works in healthcare, which is huge numbers if you think of it. not just as a nurse or as a physician, but very broadly, also data analysts, people with economy background, uh, many others, one in six. And despite the fact that we increase so rapidly, the gap between that what was needed and the actual workforce was even increasing faster. So we foresee that if we continue on this pace, in 2030, yeah. which is only seven years from now, it mm -hmm. would be one in five. And in 2040, it would be one in four needing to work in healthcare, at the ministry, but at many other places. This will not happen. At least it's very, very unlikely. If you also see all the other challenges that we have in society, whether that is the need for the energy transition or, well, just say anything else, education. So we have to find other ways of actually delivering, whether that is for my ministry, but also in healthcare, of delivering what is needed. So what steps are you taking right now to bridge that gap? So uh, one of that is that uh, we came to the conclusion that the yeah. Dutch system of healthcare, which is traditionally based on what is internationally called a system of managed competition. Okay. Could so you I'm help define this for the audience a little sure, bit? Sure. So the, uh, the idea is that in the Netherlands we have a system for healthcare which is publicly financed. 
most of the in most of the money for healthcare comes from income tax, and part of that you pay all yourself for a health insurance monthly. But those of you who have low income yeah. are then by government again reimbursed for that. So it's more than 95% is publicly financed and is based on solidarity, equal access for everybody, whether you have income or not, whether you have any money on your bank account or not, and we're very proud of that. Uh, it means that when you need healthcare, irrespective, it may also be very expensive treatment or a very expensive drug, it's there. I've also worked in the US, it was totally different. In the US, when you get to the outpatient clinic of the physician or the nurse, there was first a credit card machine. And you first have to put in your credit card, do a down payment, and then being called to the nurse of the physician or the physician. That's totally different, right? Yeah. We, in the Netherlands, we do not have that. So publicly financed, based on solidarity, but then the concept from government sets certain rules mm -hmm. and a fixed budget per year. This year, for the first time, it will be more than 1 billion euro in the Netherlands, 1 billion. Sure. But then for the healthcare providers, whether it's your primary care physician, your physiotherapist, your dentist, the hospital, etc., they are private. Mm. Yeah. And uh, the system then is based on the assumption that if you keep those providers yeah. into competition with each other... Then quality increases. Then the quality increases the while, the incre while you limit the price increase. Well, that is a very interesting assumption, but in, and it's the basis for Dutch healthcare already for a very long time, but in the current situation, with the shortage in workforce, yeah. with the complexity of healthcare, the increasing demand, etc., this does not work any longer. So we have to make a change. And what's uh, the, these managed competition countries that also still have all of these same issues: understaffing, sometimes a low sure. quality of care. It's so not just the managed competition; it's everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. So then, why is just changing this system going to walk away from managed competition into a cooperative system going to make the change? Well. I'm not changing the system itself in terms okay. of the public financing, the solidarity, et cetera. But what I do want to go and move away from yeah. is that the assumption that if you have in the Netherlands, we do have approximately 20,000 healthcare organizations in the Netherlands, 20,000, mm. each in competition with each other, not sharing data in healthcare. When you move as a patient from, in the Netherlands, when you move as a patient from one institute and one provider to another, it still the communication right. between them is on paper or with a fax machine nowadays. I don't know whether you still know what a fax machine is, but this is no. what we use in healthcare, right? Still, still, still. to this day. So um, what I'm trying to move to is yeah. that we do go to more integrated healthcare networks okay. across the full range from primary care, mental health care, long-term care, hospital health care, and that there is also simply the demand for uh, data exchange if patients move, right. and that there is the collaboration within a network so that every patient can be seen and treated yeah. or diagnosed at a site where the knowledge for that particular complaint and condition is at the highest. Right. Yeah, so, uh, and, what uh, right so. now are you doing to uh, implement this cooperation? Well, what we did uh, for that is, other than in the past, where uh, negotiations between the ministry at the start of the government term always were focused basically on finance and then just the negotiations per domain, uh, primary yeah. care, long-term care, etc. What my colleagues and I did when we started last year is that we brought all the different domains in healthcare together, primary care, hospitals, etc., uh, and did not primarily focus on the finance, but right. first on the need to come to an integrated agenda for the coming years. It's called an integrated health agreement, yeah. uh, in Dutch the ESA. Um, which focuses on optimizing and sharing capacity, sharing data, sharing people, but also for certain parts of care, concentrating the care when needed. Yeah, because um, maybe if, if, if we stick for one moment to the um, managed competition thing, I yeah. think in the coalition accord, it says uh, that the current system won't be challenged in any way. No. Does this maybe create some friction then? No, it doesn't, but then you have to look carefully at what we define with the current system. And the current system, as again, as mentioned, is the public financing. Yeah. Okay. It is the solidarity principle, which basically also is 
challenged, right? Because yeah. of the sometimes very expensive cost for certain treatments, etc. But so the, uh, the uh, uh, solidarity system and the fact that healthcare is provided by private providers, yeah. mm -hmm. the only thing which I challenge, but this doesn't ask for a change in the system, is that the providers collaborate instead of solely compete with each other. Yeah, yeah, and concentrate. Uh, when needed, con yes. Co concentration yep. of, uh, yep. and you, you, you made a big decision on this. There has been going on an, uh, <laughs> an uh, I think a discussion of 30 years maybe, yes. on the concentration of heart surgery for chi children in, yeah. the, in the Netherlands. Yeah. And uh, you picked uh, Groningen and uh, Rotterdam. Yeah. Um, and some people were very disappointed. Sure. Uh, they are av even taking you to court now. We'll see. We're not there yet. We'll see. Have you already lawyered up in preparation? Uh, we, we, we won't go into that, right? Okay. Uh, but the only thing that I can say is um, just think of, and it's always it's interesting to see, but it's, it's, it's wonderful to share the um, issue also with the audience. Just think of a debate that has been ongoing for 30 years, which would for many people basically be almost the length of a career, for 30 years, one report after another, always saying that for this very, very complex high-end care, which is only being done in the Netherlands by just a little more than two hands full of people, surgeons, where children are being born with a cardiac malformation, very complex conditions. And some of these children need surgery immediately after them being born, otherwise they will die. And this is being done in the Netherlands, this type of surgery at five different sites in a country which is only 150 by 300 kilometers. It's not Australia, right? Uh, <laughs> it's 150 by 300 kilometers, 18 million people, five different sites, just more than 10 doctors. And 30 years, the reports, everybody, the health inspection authorities, the doctor organizations, the hospitals, yeah. uh, everybody says, let's please concentrate that. But if you make the decision, mm -hmm. it automatically means that you have to decide that it will be concentrated in certain centers and thus that it stops at others. Yeah. I mean, otherwise you can't concentrate, right? And now everybody says you need to concentrate, but everybody also said, but you need to concentrate it at my side. Well, the two do not match. So at some point you have to make a decision which does not make everybody right. happy. But the healthcare authority has provided some advice against the location that you've decided upon, especially because the uh, Leiden hospital will lose its status as an academic hospital. Hmm. So do you have any plans to reconsider the decision? Uh, for one, uh, I do not agree with your conclusion that the health uh, authority advised against my decision. They didn't. Okay. They didn't. Uh, not at all. Uh, what I asked them to do is to look at the impact for each individual center. What happens if, all, if we move the care to that center? Yeah. Or vice versa, what if we take it away from that center? And they gave an advice for all of the centers. Knowing that if you concentrate for this will become reality for in one way or another for all four of them. Um, and uh, that impact analysis is very, very helpful for the, for, the, for the further process. But then do you have plans to reconsider the decision or is it set? I just, no, it's, it's a preliminary decision okay. for which all the centers can now give input. Let me just give an answer to your remark about academic status of an institute. Academic institute of a hospital like here, Amsterdam, UMC, is related to having a medical school. Will removing and stopping pediatric cardiothoracic surgery in a center do anything with the medical school? None, none whatsoever. But, but so will the academic status disappear? Of course not. But the, the, the interesting thing is that they, they say they will. Sure, but they but say they, a lot. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but then, uh, but then the, the, the discussion for you must be hard because you, you say, well, it, it, it clearly isn't, and still you have to deal with, for example, so lighting alleging that. I see the dean here on the first row, but I suppose not all of the, of all of the decisions that the dean uh, and the school leadership takes will be fully supported by all of the students. So what can you do? You can yeah. uh, be uh, an opponent, etc. But you can also spread some information which you know is false, 
but way which may bring the dean in a difficult position, suddenly having to explain, yeah. etc. So well, you, you, I mean, you, you, won't, uh, you won't cave on that. Okay, uh, no. maybe it's a good time to move on yeah, to audience questions. Yeah, let's move on to there. some audience questions. If any of you do have a question for the minister, we would love to hear them. Um, the, wonderful. The let's microphone will come to you. The gentleman up the front. Yes. Okay, so um, I had a question along with uh, like the shifting away of providing healthcare uh, with publicly uh, organized parties to privately owned ones. There was also a shift from uh, uh, the government providing most healthcare for elderly and disabled people to trying to shift it onto like family members and, and acquaintances as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And this system has been getting a lot of stress lately and it has stopped uh, it, it, the, the, it has been getting more challenged more and more lately. Uh, what are your plans for uh, for this particular system? Uh, do you want to change it, leave it, or regress backwards? Yeah, thank you. So this is a very important question. And as I mentioned, the demand in healthcare has risen much faster, not just last year or COVID, but already long before that, has risen much faster than we can deliver, than we can accommodate. Even when we have increased with our work staff, as quickly as we just said. So it means many different approaches. It means more working in network instead of competition, thus allowing to optimize the use of our capacity and also ensure that every individual patient is seen directly at the place where he or she is most murdered. But it also demands that we rethink what we consider within the realm of healthcare. What is really health and sickness related issues that need to be addressed by healthcare and healthcare workers, what can be done by individuals, and that also relates to your question uh, that certain types of care, also in the long-term care and the care for elderly, need to be more optimized, but also being uh, uh, by use of uh, digital systems, but also, indeed, more care from a family setting. We cannot accommodate otherwise. And this is not just a Dutch um, uh, issue. Again, this is almost globally. Yes, no. universal. No. Um, do we have another question from the audience? Uh, uh, Mr. Be Mr. Beetsma. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, welcome again. Uh, thank you. One of the questions, well, as an economist, I look at efficiency of systems. Yeah. We have certain uh, issues like maybe back pains, those kind of things, which are very common, which are maybe not very interesting from a medical point of view. I'm wondering, and, and the problem I yeah. think with the healthcare system is that we only look at costs, but not look at, say, benefits in the sense of there is not an integral calculation. So if you, for example, help people Maybe uh, you know use private sector uh, provision for people to get them uh, you know off their back pains eh, very fast. Then they can become productive again, and that yeah. is a gain for society. Yeah. I have the impression, but maybe it's not true, that we um, do not use in make in enough use of say private mechanisms, private provision for these common. Uh, problems which keep people from work and yeah. if you get them to work they will become pro productive and that of course is a, is a gain for, uh, yeah. uh, for society. Thank yeah. you. Well for one I very much agree that uh, we should much much more focus on the actual benefits of healthcare and you can also do that from a financial or societal perspective. Uh, there is often a lot of focus, I already mentioned the 1 billion euro expenditure on healthcare, it may sound as something that is irresponsible or too much, etc. But that doesn't have to be the case. It actually gives us a lot of return on that investment. And you can just also, econo in economical terms, as you already uh, mentioned in your question, you can calculate that. Um, and thus, um, that's the exact reason why, other than in the past, my colleagues and I, when we started, did not start with making an, inter an agreement with all the healthcare partners 
first focused on the money. It may sound strange as a Ministry of Health with these expenditures, but my first reply was, I am not primarily concerned with the money. Uh, the money that is needed, I mean, of, of course, all in terms of what we can send, but it is all focused on the question which is there, the highest impact that we can have, and the available workforce. And of course, then you also, at the end of the day, come to the question of money. Now, if I make uh, one example to also give it a case, we now see often the discussion on the reward for particular types of very expensive drugs. And then the question, of course, is say that you have a child with a life-threatening condition which will lead to early mortality, early death, and you have a life-saving medical treatment. Then for many pharmaceutical companies, now the, the, the equation is, okay, if you get 70 extra life years gained, and it may cost, or the yield is 50,000 euro per life year, then this may, medication may cost like three and a half million euro. Well, I just usually like to turn the clock back 100 years ago, when an appendicitis, in Dutch, a blinde darm ontsteking, appendicitis was lethal for children. And then we developed a type of surgery which is now in almost 100% of the cases is life-saving, and we pay for the procedure very little money. If you go back and you take your account, then appendicitis, actually the benefit is three and a half million euro. And I think it's very important to keep that in the back of our head and repeat it again and again, and thus also justify rightful uh, uh, financial expenditures in healthcare. They give us a lot of benefit. All right, we will take one more question. Can I get, while, while the microphone is moving, yeah. just on top, just for your idea, while the move microphone is going to somebody with the next question. Yeah, there. Um, if you just look at the innovation in healthcare over the past little more than 20 years, in 23 years, life expectancy of the world population increased with 5.3 years. So, say roughly five years gained in life expectancy in 20 years' time. This is, of course, due to vaccination programs, clean water supply, etc., but also due to other developments in health and healthcare. In healthcare. Uh, if you're not impressed with five years in 20 years, just think of it that it actually means it's every year three months or every week a couple of days. I loosely like to say it for just for students, just think of it that every week you age with five days and the weekend is for free. Yeah. Uh, this is the impact that we had in healthcare. And if you then calculate that in financial terms, it's huge. Actually, before we go into the next question, yeah. I do have a question. What are you doing right now to foster this innovation in the Netherlands? Oh, we do a lot. Uh, of course, there is a lot of extra expenditure also going by uh, uh, Robert Dijkgraaf and others to um, also a D66 minister uh, into uh, education and uh, uh, research, which includes research in the uh, medical and biomedical field. Uh, what uh, we also do is we have a national groeifonds, uh, which also stimulates uh, research, for instance, in the, uh, in the biotech and biomedical field a lot. Uh, many of that, we have to realize, is first open research where you do not immediately see the applicability in the short term. But with many of these in innovations, you do can foresee the uh, innovation and the impact on the longer term. There we go with the question, yes. Uh, I was wondering, when you were talking about sharing information with the journalists, you mentioned that you hired many lawyers, right? Yeah. So, and you're looking for a position? Or, uh, oh, no, yeah. no. I'm not a lawyer. Um, but um, I was wondering how many, because it sounds more to me like an IT kind of question, like sure. how to make it into a really accessible database. Absolutely. How many of the IT guys you hired as well? Oh, I can't give you the exact number of IT guys, sorry, I don't know that by heart. But uh, yes, it's absolutely true that uh, IT and automated searches for search terms, etc., is already very, very helpful. 
You know, it's not the lawyers who have to then first start reading when uh, doing the selection. But uh, just to give you an idea for um, the, the, the way in the Netherlands, like in other places, the law works is that if you provide and make certain information public, you have to scrutinize that there are not the, for many people, the individual names or their further details like their address or email or phone number, etc. So, uh, and you have to do a, a counter check with the people whose information is in, included and ask every individual one of them whether they consent to making that information available. So there's many different aspects in that. So I, I can't hear it. Uh, no. Oh. No. Oh, okay. okay. Um, then we, we, we move on to the, the topic of uh, drugs. Yeah. Uh, as earlier mentioned, um, this is a moving field uh, nowadays. Yeah. Um, you turned, you, you were 17 and turned 18 uh, when the selling of weed was legalized in 1976. <laughs> Did you make a good use of that? 1976. I was 16 then. Yes. 16. <laughs> did, did, did you make good use of that? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so for the current 18-year-olds out there then, yeah. um, not 16-year-olds, can we expect you to liberalize, liberalize the drug law even more, the opium law? Um, the opium law, now for one, which you refer to is the, um, the cannabis experiment that uh, we are embarking on, right? Which is fully focused uh, to test and see whether we can actually regulate the production, uh, the distribution, and the sales of cannabis. Uh, this is a focus which looks at uh, uh, just, of course, healthcare issues, but also uh, safety issues, crime, and many other aspects. The reason for doing that experiment is that we want to learn from it whether we can then indeed at the end legalize this whole process and thus fully regulate the whole process. We don't know yet whether we will end there. That's the whole reason of doing the experiment. It's similar to what other countries have done. And there are certain states in the United States. There's a lot of changes like this in Canada, to give examples. Uh, and this has been, to get to this experiment has been a lengthy pro uh, process. We just announced yesterday, the Minister uh, of Justice uh, and Safety and myself yesterday, that uh, we aim to start in the final quarter of this year, first in two cities in the Netherlands, uh, Breda and Tilburg, and then uh, we'll expand later, hopefully also including one part of the city here in Amsterdam. Yeah. Why did you announce it yesterday? What led to that decision? Oh, we had a debate in Parliament, uh, but this was already a process, so it was exactly. announced during the debate, uh, yeah. because it came up in the questions, but it had already been a process for a long time uh, getting there. Because the, um, the, the news before that was that it would be postponed yeah. until uh, 2024, I believe. Yeah. Um, so did there change something that you said, oh, they are ready or let's, yeah. let's just start? So the start of the experiment has had significant delays till now. Yeah. And this had all to do with uh, the lengthy selection process of individual growers, uh, okay. but also the individual cities that could participate and getting everybody aligned. Hmm. Um, and what we do now is that we actually say, well, with one grower already up and running, and hopefully two others soon to, be to follow, we can start earlier in two cities, not all at the same time, but we can start earlier in two cities, already test the test and trace system and everything, and then within six months thereafter also include all the others. But before being able to do that, we have to have a steady supply of sufficient quantity, quality, and also diversity. Otherwise, if you don't have that, no. and you already start, then you will have an immediate failure of your whole pilot. No. Okay. We did read about one farmer called Fred van der Weel, um, who had already started to grow cannabis for the experiment. Yeah. Is he going to be able to participate in this scheme, or what should he end up this doing? The first grower will be participate okay. in this scheme, Great. yeah. Because and he was already, uh, there was already a claim, let's, let me deliver already now. And the reason for not doing that is, as I just mentioned, yeah. if we would do that, oh. it would, within weeks, lead to a failure of the whole pilot and then a stop again. And we don't want that. Right. Oh. Oh. 
Just in general, why did you decide to go with a pilot experiment instead of straight off decriminalization like they did in mm. states like Massachusetts or in Canada? Yeah, uh, it's not straight off in the same. Uh, so uh, for one, there's been already an ongoing process. So it was a heritage which I got as a minister right. for already from a previous cabinet. So it had been decided that we would do it according to this approach. Obviously, again, with the pros and cons. Uh, but for rightful reasons, do it in a pilot. It may also sound very, very Dutch, but learn from the experience and make a decision based on that. Okay. Um, now, this is not the only experiment that you're working on at the moment. The Coalition or Accord also announced a uh, Staatskommissie, which will look into the medicinal yep. use of ecstasy. Yeah. Um, and this should provide advice by the end of 2023. Yeah. So what are the possible implications of whatever this advice will be? Well, I think in broader terms, also if you look at this, MDMA, but, but you can also look at cannabis. Well, we have in the meantime come to the recognition over term very long that for compounds like this, sometimes there are also very good medicinal purposes and medicinal use. They may actually benefit patients with certain conditions. And so we, ask, we will ask a state committee, we are on the for, uh, working now on the formation of it, to come with an advice in terms of the medicinal use of MDMA, um, which uh, I think is a very, very good uh, development. So I'm very glad that we will soon be able to install such a commission, committee. Yeah, right. and um, if they were to uh, advise positively and they say, well, this, this, this can work, um, how, how, how would then the roadmap look like? Is it, is it then part legalization or how, how does that work? Mm. Uh, if we just look at the comparison with the medicinal use of cannabis, which we already have uh, for a long term, there we have a, um, a, a strictly um, uh, firewalled uh, process where for medicinal use it's strictly controlled, it's a separate grower under very strict conditions and then being used also in a controlled session. Depending on the outcome, and I, I, mean, I cannot say anything yet on the outcome and the advice of the committee, we would have to search for certain opportunities, whether or not MDMA can be available for certain medical conditions. If you look at it on a very broad perspective, you have to realize that uh, very broadly there are many, many products regularly used as medicines, mm -hmm. which uh, sometimes also get a use for other purposes. Uh, yeah. And you, the, the way we do that is, for medicinal use, strictly control it. So let's talk about those other purposes, though. As a recreational use, roughly 20% of all people between 18 and 25 have used ecstasy in the past for recreational use. Roughly 20% of this audience, then. Yeah. <laughs> it costs less than five euros on the street. Yeah. But um, there's a high risk of it being impure. It can be dangerous. Yeah. So for the safety of the 20% of your audience here, would you mm. consider legalization for recreational use? For now, no. Okay. Uh, no. Why? Uh, well, uh, because there may be many other uh, implications in that. Uh, uh, first of all, in terms of health and healthcare. Yeah. Uh, also in terms of the whole criminal uh, process and everything. But there's around. already a criminal process in place, right? Sure. The Netherlands is one of the largest producers, if it is the largest producer in Europe of XTC. Uh, and unfortunately, partly for here, but the largest part uh, for uh, international use, it's, it's being exported everywhere. Uh, and I think we also have to realize the whole crime scene behind it, which is huge. Right? So, so if it was decriminalized, if it could be regulated by the government, wouldn't that end up being healthier and safer for everyone. Yeah, but then uh, welcome in the world of uh, uh, um, public offices. If you take uh, movements like that, yeah. you have to do that by definition on an international level, okay. and you have to take many potential other side effects into perspective. So it sounds very easy. Let's just legalize and set up a factory. It may even be a factory from government-led or publicly yeah. financed, mm -hmm. yeah. but it doesn't work that way, like that. Maybe one question before we go back to the, to the audience. Yeah. Um, I read several uh, interviews with you, and the interviewers always notice that when it becomes problematic or there's a lot of criticism or a big problem, uh, you then laugh. 
<laughs> and <laughs> and you, you, you just did so again. And, yeah. and w when I said about Uel and Messé, who, uh, like other people would maybe get angry, like... Uh, I, uh, oh, yeah, no. But, but, but here, here, here you go again. It's, 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 <laughs> is, this, is, is this like your approach to life? Like every problem can be fixed or I can deal with it? Or uh, Can you elaborate a bit on that? Well, for, <laughs> for one, sorry, I, I can't stop laughing now. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think it's a very safe approach uh, to first uh, be a bit... Uh, uh, self-critical, etc., and, uh, and and also have approached. Indeed, yeah, every problem can be fixed. And in all honesty, um, and you may have all a different background, etc., and will have different work experience. But if you have worked from a young age in healthcare and also in acute medicine, yeah. and at 2 a.m. you're on your own, a nurse and a physician, and you get a patient who is fully reliant on you and is life-threateningly ill. If you have that background and that experience, and you have experience and at some point know how to deal with that, it is extremely helpful in any other job that you later come to. Uh, and so it's not marginalizing or, or uh, limited the, 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 the impact of other questions, but always know that you work in a team and that uh, issues can always be larger than that what you have to face, whether it's in parliament or as a minister or... You know. hmm. yeah. Yeah. So uh, a good laugh, uh, also starting, first of all, laugh at yourself is, I think, in many ways, uh, very helpful. Okay, okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Any questions for the minister? Uh, you were the first there with the glasses. Yeah. yeah. In second row, uh, Marius, yes, yes. And then we'll get to you. Hello. Um, what's something you really want to accomplish or what's your main goal during your time as a minister? Yeah, thank you. So, um, my main goal has already been uh, briefly uh, addressed. But what I really want to accomplish is to improve the quality and outcome, but also the access of our healthcare and healthcare system. Um, because the debate and also the message from my ministry uh, during uh, previous times has always been our healthcare is at an international top level. Well, there are many reasons why it should be at an international top level. Uh, we are a high income country, we have very, very well trained staff, we have uh, the availability of all the equipments and the drugs and everything that's needed. And we have an ideal geography, 18 million people in a very small area. This is not just a um, densely populated country, it's almost a somewhat loosely populated city. Uh, we have a, quite a large central park, but other than that, what we are is like New York or Los Angeles or anything. So if there would be any place in the world where you can deliver the best healthcare ever, it's here. And yet, if you look at many individual rankings, whether it's outcome for cancer treatment or uh, it's outcome of obstetrics or anything else or waiting times for a first intake for mental health care. There are many aspects where we should be self-critical and say, hmm, we can do much better than that. And it doesn't primarily ask first for more money, it doesn't ask for anything, but it asks for aspects that we already. So that is my target, improve and get us to the position where we belong. Uh, I think you were yeah. the second, yeah. yes, the microphone will come to you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the interview, and I guess yeah. it's a bit of two questions in one. Yeah. So, um, as was also very much um, highlighted in the media in the recent years, um, Netherlands has very much been implicated in the transportation of cocaine throughout Europe. Yeah. Uh, partially due to the Rotterdam port, but ha some have also argued it is due to the fact that uh, the production of weed is not decriminalized yet. So a uh, question I would be like, A, do you think that this, um, the, prob the cocaine problem in the Netherlands has, is inter like, correlated with um, the current legal, like, legal situation of weed? And do you think that legalizing weed more would lead to a breakdown in this uh, cocaine yeah. issue? Yeah, so thanks. So first of all, um, 
I think that the experiment on the cannabis, which I already mentioned, will be an extremely important one. And I'm also in that respect uh, very much looking at the experiences in other countries. I hope to be able to visit and get more knowledge, for instance, soon from the situation and the experience that they had in Canada. Uh, so we learn from each other while also doing the experiment here. And as already said, uh, I, I cannot go and jump forward to potential conclusions and outcomes of the experiment, but the whole reason for doing this is, of course, to see whether or not regulation can actually help, also in terms of the criminal situation. Now, in the broader perspective, and you mentioned uh, hard drugs, um, yeah, we have, we have very, very serious issues here in the Netherlands. And uh, if you look at the whole crime scene behind it, it is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Uh, and it's very, very international. And you've heard the news, for instance, that when they intensify the screening for drugs, for instance, in the Rotterdam Harbor, then the problem, in part, simply jumps over to Antwerp. Mm. And the harbors have to collaborate. But it's not just that. It's collaboration across the whole globe, uh, the different continents, uh, with networks of, in the crime scene which work in many different parts, money which goes all over the world, uh, people who actually go all over the world. Uh, you've seen that one of the people who is now luckily behind bars in the Netherlands, who came from the Netherlands, was here, went to, um, in this case, one of the Middle East countries and eventually was being captured over there. Uh, so it's a very international world. And uh, without putting the burden on it, you mentioned the 25 and 25 percent. Uh, I think, from one, it's obvious that the Minister of Health, uh, I know very well, I have, uh, I, I know very well the regular use of drugs like MDMA and ecstasy. Um, I think we also should all realize, A, there are potential and significant healthcare effects related to this use. Uh, I've been working as a liver and gastroenterology, a gut doctor, I've seen more than a few patients who had um, ultimately suddenly needed a liver transplant. Young people who took something and then developed liver failure and needed an immediate liver transplant due to simply taking at a party one particular drug. Now, uh, that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect, of course, is that by the widespread use in this crime scene, you also sort of um, yeah, supply this whole crime scene. Hmm. So uh, different aspects which focus, first of all, on looking at health aspects and safety. Thus, very important to look at potential impacts and possibilities for regulation looking at the medicinal aspects, but, uh, yeah, of course, also looking at the illegal aspects of it. And this has many different, uh, uh, so, uh, many different um, aspects in it. Um, thank you so much for all of the brilliant audience questions we've had today. Um, Finally, I'd like to get back to something that you just mentioned before we went to the audience questions, which was being in the hospital at 2 a.m. with no. the healthcare provider. Um, <clears throat> the healthcare industry working in a hospital sounds uh, incredibly difficult. You have long, long hours. Um, the sector is struggling with labor shortages right now. It is difficult working conditions. So ultimately, for people in the audience who might be thinking about it, why is it worthwhile <laughs> to work in the healthcare industry? Oh, thank you. Well, uh, I'm biased, right? Uh, let, me, of uh, let me start That's why with saying that. With, I'm biased, but I'm convinced that working in the healthcare and healthcare sector, whether it's as a nurse or a physician, but also in any other roles, is, is extremely rewarding and is perhaps one of the most rewarding sites to actually work in and work for. Uh, healthcare affects everybody, whether it is yourself directly as a person and you have a condition, or it's family members, it's your parents or grandparents or everybody, but everybody at one point in your life, and usually at many different points, 
you get immediate focused and uh, in contact with healthcare and healthcare issues. Uh, and working there and actually seeing that uh, you have so much a diversity of people, it's always teamwork. It's very, very rewarding to see the immediate in the effects have uh, all the, well, the thrill, of course, or sometimes also the stress with it. It's, it's a tremendous setting. So if there's any, anybody considering to go and work in healthcare, uh, my advice is go for it. Um, maybe you could uh, lastly tell us uh, something about, I think, what, what you called up until this now, uh, up until now the highlight of your career. You developed as a doctor cutting-edge gastro-cancer treatment. Uh, uh, you, you did research into that, which yep. is still leading in, uh, uh, in all world rankings uh, up until this day. <laughs> um, why was this research in particular um, personally important to you? Um. Well, I already mentioned that everybody has a relation, but if you look at, uh, uh, my focus was indeed on cancer of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, which in Dutch is maag-darm system. Uh, and we just realized that almost a quarter of all human cancers occur in the GI tract. I won't go into all the reasons for that, but almost a quarter. And all of these conditions actually have precursors which can be early diagnosed, treated, and then cancer can be prevented. And if I look at my own situation, um, I had direct family members like my mother who died of such a condition at an early age. Uh, she could have been early diagnosed and early treated. So if you know what the reasons are for actually doing this, it may be your direct family member, but I've also seen many, many patients with these conditions which could have been prevented. And so the reason for me to actually get a lot of extra energy out of this whole uh, uh, research was this immediate view on what, how it can impact patients and how it can save lives. And one of the things that I therefore did was to um, actually put a lot of energy in getting a colorectal cancer uh, screening program here in the Netherlands. You're all far too young to already be eligible for the invitation, but you will at some point. <laughs> Uh, and uh, what we've seen after a number of years is due to this screening program, again, which cost hardly any money and is f very much uh, cost effective, we see the numbers of colorectal cancers in the Netherlands going markedly down. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Incredible. Um, well, thank you so much, Mr. Kuipers, for coming here today. A pleasure. Um, unfortunately, we... We didn't talk about Brisbane, right? No, not yeah. yet. We can talk about that after. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, we do have a flight to catch, I believe, so you don't have too long to hang around and answer questions from the audience. But thank you still so much for coming today. Um, to our wonderful audience, also, thank you so much for joining us. Um, this interview will be available along with all of the other Room for Discussion interviews as a podcast and on YouTube. Like um, if you think, wow, these guys have a really cool job, it can be yours. We are open for uh, applicants at the moment, so we really hope uh, you apply to Room for Discussion. Uh, we have our next g uh, guest you know very well, I think. You see her, uh, uh, I think, uh, a lot, uh, Christiane van der Waal. Yep. Um, she's also a minister, uh, but then for agriculture, so come see uh, that event. And we also have a newsletter, so if you want to find out about our future interviews as well, just come up to any of us who are scrambling around afterwards and ask to join. Um, again, thank you so much for coming today. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for coming to Room for Discussion. Mr. Guybridge. Yeah.